Hey everybody, we're here with my friends Ian Westerman and Joel Chasnoff to talk about their new book, Essential Tennis. Really excited about this book coming out uh, because it has a, a wealth of knowledge for you all to learn from. And uh, yeah, I just want to welcome you both to, you. Uh, to the video and really appreciate you uh, yeah. taking the time. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. And first off, I mean, Ian, we'll go to you first. I mean, you've made mm. so much content, you know, in video format, podcasts, probably one of the longest running tennis podcasts uh, of all time. So why did you decide mm. to all of a sudden now write a book, which is not an easy task? Well, uh, a couple reasons. I mean, it's always definitely been a dream of mine as as a content creator and as uh, a coach and somebody I generally enjoy publishing things to help other people and help other people succeed. And the book is kind of, I guess, in the media world, historically has been kind of the pinnacle of, you know, kind of that you know, achievement of being able to be uh, somebody who, for a living, produces guidance and help and that sort of thing. So I like, I just feel really proud that it's just a real thing. But also, there's a lot of people out there who aren't into YouTube, uh, who aren't mm -hmm. in the podcast or digital media. And I think it's fantastic that now the things that I've learned over the last 20 years are available for people who enjoy reading, mm -hmm. whether that be you know audiobook or Kindle or physical you know book. A lot of people still love that that medium. So so I'm yeah I'm really really happy now that can be available for people who've been waiting for it. 100%, and, and Joel, I'm curious about how you both linked up. I mean, you're a tennis player as well, and you're a comedian, as we talked about. Right. So I'm curious how you know this relationship came about. Right, well, it's uh, very much a 21st century project. I'm a 4-0, 4-5 player. I live in Israel. I uh, consume a lot of tennis content, including yours, which I love. Oh, thanks. Um, about seven years ago, I reached out to Ian and said, would you consider writing a book? Because I thought his content could be organized in the right way to produce mm -hmm. a book. And uh, it took off from there. Uh, we did it. We've only met twice. This is only this yeah. week is the second this time. This is number we two. Wow. Spent <laughs> time in person, yeah. but otherwise yeah. it was over, you know, over the phone, over Zoom, uh, email exchanges, outlining content. So uh, it was definitely uh, technology helped us create this together. Yeah, that's wonderful. And Ian, you mentioned an audiobook, which is mm -hmm. a great format. I mean, it goes right along the lines of your podcast yeah. as well. Uh, I'm curious uh, how that process was for you because that sounds like uh, not very easy thing to do. <laughs> no, it was honestly it was, uh, probably the biggest challenge I've had in creating content was the audiobook. Yeah. After day one, I honestly didn't know, like going to bed that night, if I was going to be able to do it. You would think <laughs> it would be the easiest because yeah, all you're doing is really reading. hard. <laughs> so, what was hard about it? Well, what was hard about it, I don't know if you and I have even talked about this, but no. obviously it's like. Um, concepts and ideas that obviously I'm familiar with, but the wording is just slightly like nuanced, you know, a little bit differently. And I'm, I'm reading into a microphone in my home studio mm -hmm. and there's two technicians listening uh, live and reading along as I'm, as I'm reading. So if, for example, I say the word further instead of farther, the thing is once I start a sentence, like my brain is like, ah, I know where this is going. And so I kind of, you know, fall into like the flow of like the articulation and stuff of the sentence. And if anywhere along the way you use a slightly different word than I normally would, then I have to start over again. They're like, no, 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 like go back to the beginning of the sentence. So I found myself having to be very like focused on like every word, even though I was very familiar with the content, right. because it was just you know slightly different. So four hours in a row of uh, doing that. Wow. <laughs> um, at the end of day one, I mentally was just a zombie. Like I was totally wiped out mentally, mm. and I slept 11 hours that night. And <laughs> exhausted. I, I was good. totally Almost as much as uh, Federer. <laughs> was totally tapped out. And uh, the next day I did another four hours. The next day I did another four hours. Yeah. And I, I, by the end of day three, I was I was in a pretty good rhythm. Uh, but the first day was a real struggle. Wow, that's that's not not easy. So Kudos. please listen to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> listen up, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Labor of love. <laughs> um, and then curious how the logistics worked. You know, Joel with you in Israel, and then Ian in the U.S. Uh, a lot of it was, well, do you want to describe the first step, you know, what you would happen? You would send me content ideas? Yeah, I mean, the very first thing Joel asked me to do was to put together, I think you asked me to shoot for 100 uh, pieces of content, Probably. and I, I did like 150 or 175 that I felt were kind of my core, like most important principles mm -hmm. that I feel like... If I had to explain or describe what I think is the most important for tennis players to know and understand and, and really internalize to be successful, it's going to be you know one, two, three, four, five. So I, uh, we had that initial list of like maybe 150 or, or so uh, topics, 
and then it was just a process of going back and forth and whittling it down, mm -hmm. figuring out like what um, what's the sequence going to be? Are there going to be you know different sections of different like uh, umbrellas of like topics, mm -hmm. and then just kind of going from there. And so we, the result is 38 chapters in three sections, and it's just the most important of the most important of the most important you know stuff. But that's why it takes five and a half years. This was a five-year project writing yeah. the book from the time we wrote the proposal to you know, to, to about the final manuscript. And it's because so much work goes into choosing what to keep, what to throw out. And there's always an emotional attachment when you throw something out so you're not sure. And then to edit and re-edit, make sure it sounds like Ian. You know, we want people to feel when they're reading this, mm -hmm. like Ian is sitting next to them having an intimate conversation about tennis <laughs> on a park Tell bench. me, Ian. Like, yeah. and Tell me your DC, biggest so. low to high in your bun. <laughs> That's right. This is actually exactly what the book should be about, this kind of image. Awkward. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, love that, love that. Um, and yeah, you did a great job, both of you. Uh, I'm curious, um, the first chapter included uh, uh, Nadal at the French Open and uh, analysis by Craig O'Shaughnessy, yeah. as you all know, one of the best um, tennis strategists in the world. So why did you all include that in the first chapter? Well, the first section of the book is called the improvement process, okay. and in a nutshell, it's all about how to improve, how to approach improvement so that it actually happens. And a huge part of that is having a clear perspective of what tennis actually is. Mm -hmm. And so many tennis players misunderstand tennis as being a uh, an offense-driven game, a winner-driven you know, driven game, mm -hmm. yeah. a, yeah. uh, you know, trying to aim for the corners, you know, driven game. And Craig has, over the years, has done such an incredible body of work of revealing that not only is that not true, but it's basically the opposite, even at the most elite, you know, world-class levels of play, and even the most dominant, you know, players of all time, like for, uh, Nadal at the French, the reality of how he wins points and how he wins majors is actually very different from the perception and to the extent that a normal tennis player like us misperceives mm -hmm. how you sh should try to win points, all of a sudden you're like veering off in a totally different path that mm -hmm. is gonna make the game much more frustrating, much less successful. And so that's why we opened and started with big you know, concepts like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the core takeaway from that chapter is that Nadal, as dominant as he is, actually loses 44% of all of his points yeah. during his amazing French Open runs. I mean, that's close to half. And I think a lot of people are surprised by that, but it reassures us that, you know, mistakes are allowed. You're not supposed yeah. to win every point. Yeah, 100%. Uh, great tips there. And Joel, so you wrote in the acknowledgement section that uh, your biggest wish is that you would improve your backhand, you know, oh, after good, good uh, writing this book. So yeah. I'm curious, uh, do you feel like you have improved your game and, and also, you know, any key takeaways from, uh, from the book? Yeah, I mean, I definitely have improved my game by writing this book, but not in the way I thought. It's not because mm. now my uh, backhand is better. Uh, it's because I'm more aware of what real, of how winning tennis happens. Yeah. Uh, just like Ian mentioned, that uh, playing high percentage tennis allowing your opponent to beat himself as opposed to trying to destroy him. Uh, these are concepts <laughs> that, uh, you know, before I wasn't really aware of as a casual fan, but now that I'm deeper into the game, I understand, um, you know, what winning tennis means. Yeah, 100%. And, and Ian, was there a particular topic that you found most challenging when writing the book? Uh, yeah, I would say in general the technical the technical stuff, mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of a key thing to point out is this book isn't what you won't find in this book is a whole bunch of diagrams of like forehand like position one, position two, position three. Like it's it's not about that at all. Uh, it's more of a tennis philosophy uh, book and very practical like do A, B, and C in your ne next match kind of book as mm -hmm. opposed to. 15 degrees, you know, angle with the wrist and, and all that sort of thing. But the couple of topics that we did dive in, because we just felt like you can't leave out, you know, certain elements about how to move the body and how to approach technique. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about a lot about efficiency and smoothness and, and fluidity. The kinetic and, chain. Yeah. yeah. I Huge. was coming around to the, the kinetic chain because I feel like that, I, I remember our, our phone calls about, about that. And what a huge part of the value that uh, Joel brought to the table was he never let me get away with just saying a coachy thing and having that be like the final like content. Like mm -hmm. he was constantly like pushing me to explain um, 
in more detail and more, de more detail and more detail, like again and again and again, so that he actually had like uh, the nuanced words to use to make it come across in, in, as good, you know, literature instead of just like saying low to high, you know, like <laughs> what does that like, what does that really mean? So I think the hardest parts for me and where Joel was super valuable was the more technical stuff where mm. Joel was like, whoa, 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 like we need to like break that down more, which in turn like helps me become a, a better coach as well. Totally, yeah, it's great to have the player perspective with, with Joel. And, and curious for you both, I mean, what sections or topics did you originally uh, want to have in the book but that you just had to cut? <laughs> oh, that's well, a good, there was, that's there was a good one question. chapter called David and Goliath yeah. about how mm. a weaker player should approach beating a stronger player. Mm. I love that chapter. It mm. was written and ready, but ultimately we decided there were other concepts that were similar and it just didn't make the cut. So that's one that, that did not go in there, but uh, if we do it in, write another book, that, that might go in. There's no like, you know, flashing like t title or topic that comes to mind for me uh, right away. Honestly, my head is just such a jumble of like, uh, I've made so many thousands of pieces of content over the years. Um, throughout the book writing process, Joel had to remind me like what was in it uh, and what wasn't. <laughs> because I, it's just like, it, well, as soon as I hang up the phone with Joel, my brain's immediately going to, you know, th uh, this piece of content and this one and this one and this one. And so, like circling back around again was actually a big challenge for me over the five years. Uh, and, like refocusing on like, what, what are we talking about again? Um, so yeah, that was me opting out of that question, right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing, very tactfully, very yeah, tactfully. Nothing comes to mind, uh, right? I'm in D.C., so I was I was trying on my my political <laughs> yeah. my political answer. Passed with flying colors. Well All done. Right, well done. So you know <laughs> something really cool that I found that you said in the book is that if somebody only had twenty dollars, you'd rather that they. Uh, return the book or, or not get the book and then buy mm -hmm. a tripod instead. So I'm curious why you yeah. said that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think a, a key principle in my coaching, I mean, you know, we were just working together in yeah. Mirabon. A uh, key principle for me over the years and a thing that I just keep getting reminded of again and again mm -hmm. as I work with all my students is there's always kind of dual um, realities. There's like the reality of, of what tennis internally like feels like to us mm -hmm. and the reality of what's actually happening and as long as there's there's that space in between like the bigger of a gap there is the harder it is for any of us mm -hmm. to get better because we might be working on abc over here when in reality we need xyz but we're ignoring that because we just kind of like oh yeah i get that like i understand that mm -hmm. and it's those things that most keep people stuck at any given level uh, because they've passed it by even though it's more important and fundamental in favor of more flashy, like sexy stuff. So the suggestion of getting the tripod instead is simply because there's such like borderline, like infinite value in being able to just quickly record yourself in, let's just find out. Like, yeah. No more guessing, no more relying on the ability of a coach to describe it or our teammate to describe it or um, anything like that. You can just see the reality of it immediately. Yeah. And so to me, it's the most powerful training, training aid and teaching tool there is, is, is video. Um, and so that's why we suggested that in the book. Yeah, I love video as well. I know we've had some talks about it on the podcast as well. And just, yeah. you know, even just a video alone, at you looking at it, you can really improve yourself by finding uh, issues. But then when you combine that with a great coach, like when we were filming today and you found out some really cool uh, things with my serve that I could improve upon, then that's just pure power in terms of improvement. And it was all things you knew already. Yeah. And, and you're, you know, you're like top, you know, a couple percentage points uh, quality tennis player. So it'd be very easy for somebody like you to be like, of course, like, uh, I'm supposed to be doing X, Y, Z. But finding out where those gaps are, we have so, all of us have so many blind spots. Yeah. Being able to pinpoint it's this and this and this that's most important is the most important thing. Yeah, 100%. Um, Joel, uh, so you're a comedian by trade, as I think we mentioned in the beginning. So how did that come to play, if at all, in the book process? Yeah, I mean, the, the book is not full of jokes. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's you know, some, maybe some sarcasm, or I tried to frame a few co topics in a tongue-in-cheek way. But you made it more fun than I would have. That mm. is definitely true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> not that that's saying a whole lot, but, you know. You know. Like, comedy, really, at the end of the day, is all about observation, paying it close attention and presenting an idea in a way different than the audience or reader expected. And that mm -hmm. we try to do mm -hmm. is taking concepts people are very familiar with, 
but twisting them, presenting them differently. Yeah. Uh, the Nadal point winning uh, or losing mm -hmm. uh, being a perfect example. And so that's where the you know comedy skills maybe took a different angle, but mm -hmm. were definitely useful. Yeah, I think people appreciate, you know, bits of humor here and there. Yeah, I think so. So, uh, yeah. a great combination there. Uh, and also, um, you both included a, a diagram of the chord complete with measurements. Um, mm -hmm. So, I'm curious why you did that and how important that is to know. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but well, I'm going to throw somebody under the, under the bus. Oh. Uh, it's not you, Mervyn. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> we, we did an interview with Matt uh, Bradshaw and Peter Freeman. With like, amazing. Yes. We great spent people. a whole day with them. Yeah, we had an incredible time with them. And just to illustrate like why it's so important, um, and to go back to my earlier idea of like like let's start with the most important stuff like mm -hmm. first. And if you pass by um, any key fundamental elements because you think it's too basic or oh, I already get that or whatever, you miss a lot of nuance that can help you be more successful on the court. Yeah. So uh, we asked. Uh, I don't remember how the dialogue went exactly, but they they asked a similar question, and I said, "Well, hey Matt, how how wide do you think the doubles alley is?" And uh, he, guessed, he said two feet, right? Yeah, he said two, two and a half feet. Yeah, and it's double that. It's four and a half feet mm -hmm. wide. Mm -hmm. So that might just seem like a kind of useless trivia on the surface, but as a doubles player in particular, like if that's your actual percep perception, is that the, the alley is half the width it yeah. actually is, that changes how you cover things. That changes how you pick your targets. Mm -hmm. uh, like that changes the, the patterns uh, that you use. And so that's you know just one just top of the head example. Understanding the geometry of the court to me is kind of the the core of good tactics and a good strategy. So just having a cursory, you know, understanding of what kind of dimensions were like. Here's a good one, Mirvan. Oh, I, I, now I'm gonna throw you under the bus, probably. Uh, how many uh, square feet would you guess the singles court is? Just one side. Just so, in other words, what you have to cover in a singles match. How many, how many square? <laughs> how many square feet is your like condo or apartment or wherever wherever you live? Oh yeah, you know? okay, yeah. Uh, how many square feet of, of a living space do you live in? Yeah, like eight hundred or something. Okay, okay. Now, how many square feet do you think the single square is? Just one, one half of it. You're what you're covering. Uh, seventy-eight. <laughs> It's a thousand square feet. No, <laughs> it's a thousand cut, square cut feet. Cut the video. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great apartment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, we're so like, and you're a great athlete. Like you yeah. cover tons of court. So it doesn't feel that big. <laughs> like it's not like a you know, football field, a hundred yards. Like ooh, like that's you know a lot of space. Mm -hmm. A thousand square feet. Uh, you go do the measurements. Later. <laughs> it's actually a little bit above a thousand square feet. Oh. So like having that like perception gap between like oh I don't know like couple dozen or a thousand mm -hmm. helps you kind of respect and understand how much work and intention you have to have about your positioning yeah and like where you aim and how that leaves you in a bad spot and like it all cascades down from having a good solid understanding of what the space is that we're actually working with mm. yeah it's crazy huh yeah it is crazy I'm, thank you for informing me it's bigger than your apartment i was only off by like 10x more than 10x <laughs> you know yeah not bad right. we'll give you a pass not bad not bad and then uh you know, I noticed that you mentioned certain players a lot more than the others. Some of the more classic uh, players sure. that we know of. Well, you know, relatively uh, Federer and, and Serena and so forth. Yeah. But then maybe others you didn't mention as much. I'm curious, like, how you went about in, in, you know, picking and choosing who to name in the book. Do you want to take that one? Yeah. I just talked I mean, a lot about there, footage. There was a footage. debate, uh, <laughs> even with the publisher. They, we yeah. had a note, oh, like, you wow. keep mentioning Federer, Nadal, Serena, Djokovic. Do you want to m mention some modern players? Uh, Tim, uh, Zverev, Osaka, etc. And we uh, we discussed it, and we really felt that um, the original names, Feder, Nadal, Djokovic, Serena, they're like the Mount Rushmore of of tennis. And I think we're going to look back on this era and just marvel at how talented they were. That between the four of them, there are close to 80 Grand Slams won. And, <laughs> That's um, nuts. Yeah. And it will and it will never be done again. And I think some of the players we talk about now as next gen players. In three or four years, they might win a major or two, but then be out of the game. And they have a longevity, Federer and, and those crew, that even years from now, we can still respect and still turn to. And that justifies them being the, the names in the book. You yeah. agree? Me? Yeah. Yeah, we wanted the book to remain as relevant and timeless as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, our, I guess Joel and I, our fear was in, in being a little bit more... Um, uh, spread out, you know, in the examples that we use, mm -hmm. that picking up the book 10 years from now or 20 years from now, yeah. it'd just be hard for somebody to, you know, to be like 
Doga Polov. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, like, there's not as much of a picture, you know, immediately. No, no disrespect to, to go Doga Polov. Yeah, I don't even know of course. Who that is. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's a good, good player. Um, so this book, you know, I, we've, we've got a lot of other uh, nice books out there. Of course, a lot of the classic ones, Winning Ugly, Brad Gilbert, yeah. and, um, you know, The Mental Game of Tennis and so forth. So how do you distinguish this book, Essential Tennis, from those and the others? Yeah, to me, they felt both of those books are amazing, yeah. but they were a little bit more specialized, uh, I would say. Mm -hmm. Like the, the Inner Game of Tennis, obviously, like incredible book very focused on the mental game and psychology and, and that sort of thing which mm -hmm. is really important and then brad gilbert's book very like nuts and bolts like practical you know kind of stuff we our vision with this book was to kind of be the crossroads of all the core important parts section one is all about the improvement process and that's kind of like per perspective and a deeper understanding uh, of the game and also teaching people how to get better on their own, mm -hmm. um, which to me is kind of a, a career like goal, is to help my students yeah. be able to go self-diagnose and guide themselves through the, the, the process of improving. Um, and there's a whole section on that's called On the Courts, and so that's all about actually you know doing stuff, uh, technique-related, tactics-related, um, improvement, drills, and then the final section is about the, is about the mental game. So we were trying to kind of hit each of the, the key components of, of game improvement in a balanced but also like cohesive, you know, what, like a, it's a better word than cohesive, like uh, in one package. Like holistic. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the right Which word. That's why you brought me on to write this book. Uh, he, this, he's right. got the, the pretty words and, and I don't. But yeah. it also, the book, uh, <laughs> you know, like you mentioned earlier, a big part of it is what improvement really means. A lot of players will go out and, you know, hit 50 serves, not realizing that if they just hit 50 serves the way they did the day before, they're getting really good at the mistakes that they're continuing to make. So uh, we, we discuss improvement and those other books sort of assume you know what to do. Ours did not take it for granted that you know how to get better. Yeah, love that. And I want to ask you both to answer this. So what are y'all's favorite part of each book? <laughs> My... I had to think about this, yeah, the last interview we did, but I, I came on an answer that's definitely, like, there's only one part of the book I got emotional, like, reading during uh, the audiobook uh, reading, and that was the conclusion uh, at the mm, end of the book. Mm. Um, and it kind of tells a personal story and ties in, really kind of head-on discusses, like, the difficulty of really being passionate about this game mm. like there's so many different uh new aspects and facets you know uh like we've been talking about like, if you approach it in a holistic way there's so, you have to work on yourself in so many different ways yeah you know mentally physically uh athletically mechanically and um for me over the years maybe my most satisfying relationships with students have been starting to work with a player who feels stuck and they're like plateaued and they just they're kind of at their wits end a lot of times <laughs> working with me is kind of like their last resort like, I've mm. had a lot of students like that uh, and so they go to all the, to the, whole, to the trouble of coming all the way to Milwaukee like the most random city in the world <laughs> uh, to work with a tennis coach because they've tried like everything else yeah and um, probably one of the more gratifying things I've ever been able to do is help players through those difficult you know times and that's what the conclusion is uh, about, in light of like everything else that's in the book. Mm -hmm. And so that's my favorite. Uh, sorry, I got kind of kind of heavy there. That's super rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, the, uh, I loved all the chapters. Uh, they made it in. It was a winner in my book. But there is one chapter about uh, swing speed, and in that chapter, uh, it's sort of based on an interview that Ian did with Todd Martin, the legendary American uh, awesome. player. Awesome! Wow. And he at one point coached Djokovic and talked about how Djokovic had trouble with swing speed and uh, playing. Uh, playing a match at the, with the same intensity as he practiced. And just hearing that a player like Djokovic struggles with the same things that players at my and other people's levels do, it really really reassured me that this is a journey. It's not something that ends and you're done, but yeah. it's, it's lifelong and uh, there's growth to be had. And um, that, was, that was a good, nice personal takeaway. Mm. Love that, love that. And, and maybe a question for you both again. I mean, with just a few weeks away from the launch of the book, um, you know, how are you all feeling after, you know, you're slaving away, you know, it's a five-year project, as I understand yeah, it. over so, five at this five. point. Oh, how's the, how's the feeling there for both of you all? 
exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, I mean, but that describes me all the time. <laughs> like, I'm so uh, neck deep in content all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah, you are. That, um, uh, in, a, in a way, it was, it was nice. Like, especially early on, like, I think what I enjoyed most about the process was our early, like, our earliest, um, like, interviews, like, conversations. The more time we spent together, the worse it got. Yeah, basically. What that's, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say, yeah. I see. But uh, <laughs> when we did our initial kind of, like, um, when you would go through the, the original content, right. write, like, a first draft of it in, like, book form, and then inter I would read it, and then you would ask me questions about the content. Um, I really enjoyed that a lot. It was a nice break uh, from me kind of being the solo like having to come up with the whole concept and like write a beginning middle and end of the lesson mm -hmm. and make it all tie together and so um, while it was a lot of work and it spanned like a long period of time uh, having having Joel kind of lead the the um, structure like process mm -hmm. really allowed me to just focus on the, the coaching like the like the actual nuts and bolts of it which was actually really really enjoyable so I told the, Joel in the car on the way here, like, I can't wait until it's like June and it's actually, <laughs> it's actually like in the world and we can be like, well, like, yeah. you know, to a certain degree, like, all right, it's like done. And now we can move on and focus on just promoting the book. Right. Uh, but the process itself was fantastic. And, uh, you know, Joel was incredible to, to work with. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be nearly as good as it is without his uh, guidance uh, in the project. Very nice. I mean, what I'm proud of is already Ian's had a few people read it and have written back and mm. Uh, given great feedback. It's it's already number one in Amazon coaching, even though it's not out yet. That's awesome. how many people pre-ordered and got excited. So uh, the idea that people could actually get better from something we worked on, I mean, that's uh, when you really oh, take the yeah. time Very to think about it. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, for sure. awesome. And I guess this is more for Ian, but it, did this book cause any changes in the way that you teach or approach the game at all? Yeah, the, the, question, the question you asked earlier, uh, what was the... Um, I don't remember the context anymore, but you asked a good uh, question earlier about the different uh, parts. Oh, it was about comparing it to uh, like the inner game and oh, yeah, uh, yeah. the fact that we're trying to create kind of a holistic work, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of touches on all the key uh, parts of the game. And I feel like we, we put together something that is really powerful in that way. And so through the process of like what I described of Joel and I working back and forth collaboratively, it, and going through that range of like different topics, 38 kind of pretty distinct like different principles about how to get better at tennis. It helped me connect more dots in my own head about uh, just connection points uh, between different parts of the game, which just helps me be able to provide better service to to my students, especially in the moment. You know, uh, working with somebody on the court and maybe they're stuck on something or they're frustrated or um, it's not clear to them. How long is it going to take? And so, for me, being more and more clear about how it all fits together, mm -hmm. um, I think helps me be a, a more effective coach. Yeah, brilliant point there. So, Joel, question for you: um, Being that this isn't quite like your personal content, obviously you you contributed a lot to the book, but it's you know we're coming from like Ian's experiences and, and coaching for many many years. What was the biggest challenge that that you faced? I think the permanency of it, and you know, one phrase that I said to Ian a few times is that uh, this isn't like uh, a web page where you can go back a few days later and delete the words and, <laughs> and correct it. And I, you know, I said once this is in print, this is how it is. So we got to get it right. And there were some concepts like shape or uh, return of serve or you know other things that I really wanted to make sure I understood completely and was describing them correctly because um, this is going to be you know carved in stone as far as a book is concerned. It, you can't edit it once it's out in the world. Oh, right, it's made out of paper. Yeah. <laughs> but we wanted to, uh, you know, that, just that permanency in getting it right. Um, we have many conversations about those details. Yeah. Awesome. And I um, guess last question for you, like where is the best place to uh, get the book? I mean, we do have links below, but just, um, you know, any thoughts on that and any, any other closing thoughts? Yeah, I would encourage people, wherever, wherever, however they most like to consume written material like this, um, if you like going to an old-fashioned bookstore, it's going to be at Barnes & Noble and all the other main distributors. Uh, it's also on Amazon mm -hmm. in uh, paperback, hardcover, Audible mm -hmm. in uh, audio form, uh, Kindle in, nice. in digital form. And if you're watching this before May 31st, if you go to EssentialTennis.com slash book, then uh, the publisher and I are giving away some free bonuses as well if you pre-order before the launch of the book, so make sure to check that out. 
Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, Ian, Joel, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, and it was great to Thank talk you. about the book, and uh, definitely highly encourage that you pick up a copy of Essential Tennis. Uh, this is a great book, a lot of great knowledge in here, and you know, as I remember, I mean, getting a book is one of the things that you should have as a no-brainer. I mean, because you're essentially getting like <laughs> decades of co uh, content that somebody has learned, you know, in in a book for you know a very nominal fee, comparing to what you would have to pay if you did you know. what it cost us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> zillions of dollars. You know, in for a day or the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so definitely pick it up. And uh, thanks for watching. And thank you all. Thank you, Mirban. Appreciate of course. it. Pleasure. Thanks. Here. Thank you.